Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. So in today's video we are going to be going through a past paper question on Romeo and Juliet and I'll be using the AQA 2019 May past paper. So let's dive straight into it. So by the way, guys, as always, if I'm looking down, it's because I've got um, the slide deck presented on, projected on another laptop, so bear with me. So this question, we are given an extract from Act 1, Scene 5 of Romeo and Juliet and asked to answer the question that follows. So at this point in the play, Romeo and Juliet meet each other for the first time at the Capulet house, right? Because we know that the Capulets were hosting a party and Romeo tried to infiltrate the party, right? With his masquerade mask. So you can take a look at the extract here. And as always, you can either take a screenshot of it or if you have your own copy of the play, go ahead and uh, refer to it as we work through the analysis and the essay that I'll be going through in this video. So starting with this conversation, explore how Shakespeare presents the relationship between Romeo and Juliet. So it's very broad and we're asked to write about how Shakespeare presents their relationship in this conversation, the nature of the relationship, and how Shakespeare presents the relationship between Romeo and Juliet in the play as a whole. So some of you might find this to be way too broad um, for there to be any sort of anchor. Usually some ideas that should come to mind when we're asked to examine relationships is thinking about sort of what stage their relationship is in, right? And clearly in this context we see they are meeting each other for the first time. So there's obviously this sort of giddiness, right, um, of infatuation of seeing each other um, for the very first time and obviously falling in love. And there's this rush of emotions and bliss and giddiness that would overpower and consume them. So We'll take a look at that as I walk you through the essay. So, intro paragraph. In this moment taken from Act 1, Scene 5 of Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare presents the occasion as a meeting of intellectual and emotional equals, perhaps with the suggestion that Juliet is the leading figure in their relationship, despite Romeo's proactive courtship. So right away, the student is telling us that they are not just meeting each other on an emotional level, they are also matching each other on an intellectual level. And there's also a sense that there's a kind of feministic undertone as well, with Juliet actually taking more of the lead, despite Romeo's more eager demeanour, right? Juliet prods her ardent suitor on with verbal wit and seductive flair, and by expressing her affection with humour and nuance, confirms herself as Romeo's worthy and true equal in love. As the play progresses, the sort of light-hearted banter evident in this extract gives way to heavier, at times even melodramatic, emotionality as the lovers veer between extremes of euphoric bliss and apocalyptic despair. So the student shows us that she's very much aware of the need to examine the play as a whole when we look at how Romeo and Juliet's relationship transform and change and evolve as the play goes on. So in the rest of this essay, I will explore how these ideas are reflected in both the extract and the play at large. The first main body paragraph diving straight into the extract analysis. A key observation about this Romeo and Juliet exchange here is that they speak in sonnet form, super important here to identify as a technical feature, matching each other end rhyme for end rhyme, especially in the first eight lines. Enacting in dramatic form the palm to palm intimacy and mirroring that Juliet alludes to in the eighth line, actually. Immediately, the two characters' reciprocal speech patterns establish their emotional synchronicity, with the final word of both Romeo and Juliet's quatrains being the same word, kiss, indicating their romantic inclination towards each other. So the student is matching her observation of the syntax and the speech patterns with the emotional cadence of Romeo and Juliet at this moment. The dialogue is characterized by a flirtatious stichomythic rhythm, and within this playful sparing there are organic echoes reflected in the lexical mirroring of words and phrases such as holy, lips, pilgrims, hand, holy palmers, saints, etc. So really the point here is that there's lots of repetition and echoing back and forth between the lovers, 
And also um, there's this idea of stichomythia, which if you're studying drama, especially Shakespearean drama, you should be aware of meaning the sort of back and forth, quick paced rhythm between the uh, between characters dialogues right stichomythia so here it's uh, the stichomythia actually reinforces the flirtatious dynamic between the two so in almost every response Romeo or Juliet uses the same word that the other person has just said which creates a strong impression of magnetic chemistry because we know uh, whenever people mirror each other there's a sense of natural attraction by the way guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. So interestingly, by ascribing the sonnet-like lines to two speakers who are present with each other in the scene, Shakespeare reappropriates the sonnet's original mode as a one-sided address of a single speaker to an absent lover. So some of you who may have read Shakespearean sonnets would know that the speaker is always addressing an absent lover, right? But here, both lovers are present, but they're using the sonnet form. So it's an interesting reappropriation, reworking of the um, formal conventions. While this reinforces the mutuality of Romeo and Juliet's love, adapting the sonnet form here may recall an earlier sonnet in the play, which is actually the prologue that opens the play, which has already revealed the doomed fate of the star-crossed lovers. So by the way, if you guys aren't aware, I have an analysis video on this prologue that begins the play, on the opening prologue of the play, which you can check out here or find in the description box below. It will be super helpful for you as an understanding of the context and also dramatic irony in the play as a whole. And as such, the audience at this point would be made to feel sharply contrasting emotions by the dual function of the sonnet form at this point. On the one hand, we'll feel a sense of blissful warmth towards their young, innocent love. But equally, there's a niggling discomfort about knowing that whatever happiness Romeo and Juliet experience here were inexorably moved towards a devastating end. So the idea here is that we see the we see the two lovers being in this blissful moment as they first fall in love with each other. So we're gonna, likely we're going to feel that sort of um, with that sort of warmth, right, on behalf of them. But at the same time, because we already know from having heard from the prologue that they are actually ultimately going to be doomed and they will die. Um, as sacrifice for the family's feuds, uh, that awareness is actually going to complicate our sense of joy and bliss for them, right? Because we know, ah, but, you know, this is actually ultimately going to come to a tragic and devastating end. So it's a, it's a complicated dualistic emotion that Shakespeare has us feel here by dint of using actually the sonnet form, okay? the next paragraph. Another point worth examining is the religious analogy that Shakespeare deploys to characterize Romeo and Juliet's romantic encounter. When Romeo first propositions Juliet, he frames his attraction in terms such as profane, holy shrine, and gentle sin, which suggests both his feelings of guilt and an impulse to haloize his target of affection, right, to turn her into the saintly figure. Already, the implication that this is somehow a sinful, wrong relationship is established with Romeo's moralizing disposition. But this foreboding heaviness is momentarily offset by the whimsical, playful metaphor of my lips as two blushing pilgrims. So the seeming contrast between the fleshly and the holy, the sexually charged versus the sexually demure, crystallizes the warring tensions within Romeo, as his primal instincts urge him to touch and kiss Juliet, but his socially conditioned self tells him that mannerly devotion, which is the phrase that actually Juliet uses, must first be shown through the performance of courtship, right? So here in this paragraph, the student expands on the central observation of there being a religious analogy that overarches this extract, right? And so, and so by identifying this religious analogy, she's able to also glean Romeo's complicated emotions, right, towards how he's feeling about 
this woman, right? Especially if you are aware, this is coming very soon after he was whining about Rosalind's unrequited love for him, right? So in this paragraph, the student is able to build on her analysis on this central identification of an important feature, right? The religious analogy, um, and then also looking at the metaphor that kind of uh, branches off from that. And then the next paragraph, um, the student moves away from the analysis of the extract to the analysis of the play as a whole, right? Zooming out. So as the play continues, we see that while Romeo and Juliet's love intensifies, there are points where the communication styles are out of sync, thereby implying that for all the strong attraction that they share, the fundamental energies are mismatched, which eventually contributes to their fatal misunderstanding of each other's deaths, right? For instance, when Romeo asks Juliet in the famous balcony scene, why shall I, what shall I swear my love by? Sorry about the typo here. He's met with her blunt rebuke of do not swear at all. So they're kind of out of sync here because Romeo is saying, oh, I should swear my love by something. And Juliet's saying that's not necessary, right? And so they're on different wavelengths. And when he by yonder blessed moon vowed, when he tells her, oh, I actually already swore by the moon, she chides him for swearing by the inconstant moon and endangering their love with the threat of fickleness because the moon comes and goes every day, right? Rather than looking for outward tokens of blessing, Juliet shuns this paganistic approach for a more singular Christian framework of devotion, focusing only on Romeo, thy gracious self, which is the god of my idolatry. So the student here actually also brings in a little bit of context here, right? Uh, with the awareness of the very much Christian uh, moral framework that Shakespeare would have been working under in his time. Um, and the, of course, the kind of um, contrast between perhaps more paganistic influences, um, paganistic in influences being worshipping different gods versus the singular Christian god sort of model, right, that would have uh, that, that dominates very much the idea of Christianity, right? And so there's this interesting sort of macro-religious binary that feeds into some of the analysis here, which is interesting. And then the student moves on to look at another moment, right, later on in the play, when she says, later, when Romeo and Juliet argue over whether it is the nightingale or the lark singing as indication of whether dawn has broken, and if it is thus then time for Romeo to leave Verona for his exile, the disagreement once again reflects an underlying disconnect which is only brushed aside by sheer force of passion, right? But that passion is momentary. As Romeo goes from insisting that it was the lark, the herald of the morn, no nightingale, to conceding to Juliet's wish by saying yon grey is not the morning's eye, nor that is not the lark whose notes do beat the faulty heaven so high above our heads. So here, Again, another example of how Romeo and Juliet are in some ways fundamentally quite out of sync with each other, right? Um, they may love each other a lot on a sort of raw primal uh, emotional level, but perhaps in terms of communication uh, and fundamental physical sort of understanding for each other, it's somewhat lacking and perhaps that you know contributes to ultimately their tragedy. Okay, so wrapping up, the student says, these moments culminate in what's perhaps the greatest example of literary miscommunication, which is when in the final act, Juliet and Romeo first address each other in absentia, right? Juliet before she takes the sleeping potion and Romeo when he prepares to take the poison next to Juliet's body and ultimately commits suicide on assuming, and in Juliet's case, seeing actually the other person dead, all right? So here you go, another essay, uh, very much top grade, right? Hitting all of the assessment objectives with ample use of textual evidence, uh, both from the extract and also the play as a whole, looking at different moments in the play, spanning across um, the beginning, the middle, and the end of the play, right? Not just isolating um, the textual evidence in one section of the play. Uh, and of course, also analysis that closely relates the use of whatever stylistic, syntactical, structural techniques with the theme and topic at hand that the student is um, analyzing. And also, of course, you know, expressed in eloquent language and sophisticated vocabulary, etc., hitting that final assessment objective four, okay?
So I hope this was helpful for you guys in terms of understanding what a top grade Romeo and Juliet essay would look like. And if you found this helpful in any way, please do hit the thumbs up button below as always so that you can encourage me to keep making these useful English lit study videos for you. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe to this channel so you never miss out on my weekly lit study videos. I have a whole bunch of Romeo and Juliet videos that you can check out as well some of them or sample essay walkthroughs, others character analysis and uh, language analysis, etc. So go ahead and check out my playlist for that in the description box below. And as always, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!